Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. From 2010 to 2013, Jose Mourinho was in charge of Real Madrid. Having come off a wildly successful spell at prior club Inter Milan, a lot was expected of him. And he delivered silverware, winning three pieces of silverware during his three-year reign. The number of trophies may not directly reflect the quality of the team, because undoubtedly they were one of the premier teams in Europe, but also happened to be competing against a great Barcelona side. But in 2011-12, Mourinho conquered Spain as he led Real Madrid to La Liga. But what tactics did Mourinho use whilst at Madrid? Well, in this video, we take a look. A quick shout out to my Patreons for helping to make this video possible. If you want to support, head on over to patreon.com slash simple and you'll get rewards like early access to videos and exclusive content. And if you want to keep up with your favorite teams and players, check out the OneFootball app. It will give you team and player stats, transfer news and so much more, absolutely free through the sponsored link in the description below. Mourinho adjusted his tactics between the three seasons, but the broad principles were similar. We will, however, mainly focus on 2011-12, whilst drawing smaller elements from the other two. The 2011-12 season is in fact one of the greatest seasons in La Liga history. They broke the points record by accumulating 100, they scored the most goals with a staggering 121, with a goal difference of plus 89, as well as the most points accumulated away from home. Formationally, in matches where he felt that he needed to be more defensive and be more solid in general, he would opt for the 4-3-3 with the following personnel. The key was being able to bring in the extra defensive midfielder to make them harder to penetrate through the centre. However, in the league, this was only used twice, as he usually saved it for cup competitions against elite opposition. The trademark formation of this team was undoubtedly the 4-2-3-1, with the only personnel difference being Ozil in place of Lasana Diara and playing as a dedicated 10. Now let's start with a look at the builder play. Real Madrid enjoyed an average of 57% of possession, so let's look at how they utilised this. As a team with lots of possession, for the most part they would look to start plays by playing it short to one of the centre backs. However, against teams who pressed high, they were just as comfortable going long as they would have two aerial targets in Ronaldo and one of Higuain or Benzema. As one man went in for the header, the other would run in behind, often joined by Di Maria, whilst Ozil, just behind, would look to pick up any loose possession and look to provoke an attack. Both centre-backs were comfortable on the ball, however, Ramos was much better on it and if all the midfield passing options were taken, he could take on the responsibility and drive the ball up the pitch with Pepe covering. But even when they both remained deep, Pepe would defer to Ramos on the ball, as shown by Ramos averaging more passes per game. The fullbacks also had differing roles. Alvaro Abaloa was a much more limited fullback usually only being used as an outlet who could play short passes to get the team out of pressure situations. But for the most part, he tended to stay deeper, just slightly ahead of the centre-backs when possible. Marcelo was a different case on the left, as he had on-the-ball ability that could match most midfielders. When he had the ball, he was given more permission to dribble up the line when required. But he also made riskier passes from deep, like raking crossfield passes to Di Maria who maintained his width on the right, or trying to break the lines. But even when he didn't have the ball, he would still move much higher up the pitch than Arbeloa. His greater involvement in the build-up play is shown by significantly more passes per game. In the midfield, Xabi Alonso and Sami Khedira formed a great partnership. Alonso was the conductor on the ball, so in matches where opponents pressed both of Madrid's centre-backs, Alonso would be the one to drop between them in order to break this press. But even from the midfield, despite being less mobile, he stayed deeper as the deep-lying playmaker, capable of rotating the ball around short to manoeuvre the opposition and his 78 passes per game were a team high. But he would also show his passing range, generally look to utilise the width of the entire pitch and his long balls would allow for quick and accurate switches. In fact, his 9.3 accurate long balls per game were a team high. Sami Gadira's role was much more variable. In most matches, he operated as the box-to-box -box midfielder, looking to get high to support his winger to create an overload in the wide region. But often, when Real wanted to get crosses in, they would first overload the central area, which Kadira would help by moving up. 
and once the opponents drifted central to compensate, Ria would then look to get it wide, and Kadira could act as the extra man in the box to attack the cross. However, against stronger opposition, Kadira was more disciplined, staying deeper, and Alonso would venture slightly higher to make the penetrating passes. Kadira would be the one to stay deeper as he had more physicality and looked to cover more ground defensively in case of a turnover. The presence of a double pivot meant that Mourinho gave the front four more flexibility. Ozil was, at the time, the best number 10 in the world, and due to the security behind him, would drift freely to where he found the most danger. Often, this was staying central and threading perfect through balls to one of the three ahead of him, but Ozil also liked making lateral movements, as he liked to support the winger to create an overload to either get time on the ball or to slip the man through. He was undoubtedly the creative hub of the team, through which everything flowed, averaging almost 3 key passes per game as well as accumulating 17 assists in the league, which was the most in La Liga. Di Maria was crucial to the balance of the team. When Arbeloa stayed deep on the right, Di Maria despite being left footed was happy to hug the touchline. This would naturally create more space in the centre of the pitch for Ozil and Ronaldo to operate in but he would also attack the byline and attempt 4.4 crosses per game into the two big aerial targets. But on the occasions where Arbeloa would look to overlap him, this gave Di Maria the freedom to tuck in centrally to then look for a game-breaking pass with the second most key passes per game. But he could also have shots from range as well. Either way, this played into Madrid's preference for the central overload. But Ronaldo was undoubtedly the key to the team. Ronaldo rarely ever attacked the byline on the left-hand side, instead vacating that region to allow Marcelo to overlap him and provide the width. Ronaldo would move into the left half space and even from range he was a threat, consistently having shots from outside the box. In fact, he took by far the most shots from outside the box in the league and scored the joint most from range. This danger meant that teams would look to mark him tight, at times even doubling up. All of this just opened up more space for Ozil to operate in in the centre, or if the opposition shifted across when Madrid overloaded the left, Di Maria would now be in space for the switch. But Ronaldo loved to attack the box, and when he vacated his position, Ozil often moved into the left half space as he could look to cross from these deeper regions. But Ozil would also link up well with Marcelo, feeding the ball to him so that he could look to cut back to Ronaldo or have a regular cross. Having Ronaldo and the forward meant two genuine aerial threats in the box, and as a result, Real Madrid attempted 22 crosses per game. Benzema and Higuain both started many games, often performing similar roles. Both were selfless and worked for the team, dropping deep to link the play when necessary, or even going wide when Ronaldo needed more space in central areas. Both also had eyes for goals, whether from crosses from wide regions or creating space for themselves on the edge of the box. On the defensive end, especially against weaker opposition, soon after losing the ball, Madrid would look to counterpress and win it high up where possible. But as their press was not that coordinated and could be easily bypassed, they tended to instead drop deep. And when defending deep, Real Madrid's priority was not to allow attacks through the centre of the pitch. Di Maria was extremely hard working on the defensive end and would look to drop extremely deep. This was in contrast to Ronaldo on the left hand side, where he would stay much higher up the pitch, practically as a forward, whilst Ozil was slightly deeper, meaning that at times their formation looked like a lopsided 4-3-1-2, with an emphasis on clogging the centre, as they had two dominant centre-backs who could deal with crosses. Kadira and Alonso, whilst not being traditional destroyers, both put in work, getting decent levels of tackles and interceptions. But from these deep positions, we saw one of the side's major weapons, the counter-attack. The positioning of the 4-3-1-2 put them in the perfect position for this. After winning the ball, if they wanted to go direct, Ramos and Xabi Alonso were both capable of launching it with an accurate long ball. But most of the time, Ozil was the key to the counter. As soon as they won the ball, from his advanced position, he looked to drift anywhere behind the midfielder into space. With Ronaldo and the forward running in behind, it generated space between the lines for him to receive the ball whilst Di Maria was eager to join the attack. Often the opposition's fullback would have advanced high, because as we discussed, Madrid tended to clog up the centre, so this meant that Madrid's wingers had space to operate in. Once the ball was with Ozil, he looked to drive high up the pitch whilst the others made intelligent runs before he played them in to finish off the move. 
As a result, Real had comfortably the most lethal team on the break. And it was an incredible team, one of the best that Spain has seen. But what are your memories of this Madrid side and Mourinho's spell in general? Drop them down in the comments below. If you enjoyed this, hit like and subscribe. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple.